You can have the death penalty, but you can't use the death penalty on a pregnant woman. We love an underdog yeah. and then we love to tear him down. If you vaccinate for those diseases in your country, you lose your clean and green status. There is a fundamental assumption in our culture that we need government to look after us. That if the government didn't do something, then no one would do that thing. That if the government didn't protect us, then no one would protect us. If the government didn't provide medical care, then no one would. That without government, we would devolve immediately into some Mad Max dystopia. But I, as a libertarian, believe that we don't need most of the government that we think we need. That actually the government helping is just code for the government getting in the way and breaking things. I believe we would all be better off if the government were far smaller, did far fewer things and spent far less of our money. Yes, we would all be better off, including or perhaps even especially the poorer people among us. See, there's a misconception that the government protects the poor, provides for the poor, ensures that the little guy gets his fair share. Nothing could be further from the truth. For the most part, the government is the reason why the little guy can't get ahead in life in the first place. It's usually the government's own red tape and regulation, licensing, minimum standards, that ensures that people get stuck where they are, unable to advance in life unable to escape the welfare trap. I'll give you just one example. But as you listen, keep in mind that this principle applies to every area of life. Take government food safety standards. I don't think we need them. Now, hang on a minute, Topher. Are you suggesting that anyone should be allowed to serve up any old food and kill people with food poisoning? No, that's not what I said. What I said was, I don't think we need government mandated food safety standards. I think they're a waste of time and money for a negligible improvement in food safety, and I'll prove it. Take the requirement that commercial kitchens have stainless steel bench tops. It's an easy case to make. Stainless steel saves lives. It's easy to clean, antibacterial, and in all honesty, it's actually quite nice to work on as well. I know, I've worked in commercial kitchens before, and I like the stainless steel bench tops. But people assumed that without those stainless steel bench tops, we'd all be falling over dead from food poisoning. But that's not true, and I'll prove it. Because billions of healthy meals are served and consumed in Australia every year from non-compliant kitchens. That's right. People are serving food from kitchens that do not meet the commercial code. And I'll bet you've done it too, you reckless life-endangering granny killer. It's called eating at home. And if we don't have a rampant epidemic of food poisoning deaths from meals served off of marble or melamine in people's houses, then why do we assume that we would have such a rampant epidemic of food poisoning deaths if commercial operations served from marble or stone or melamine or timber in restaurants? Why do we assume that they have to have stainless steel? It's a matter of public safety! According to the food safety website, there's 4.1 million cases of food poisoning in Australia every year, which sounds like a lot until you realize that there's something like 28.5 billion meals served in Australia every year. So that's 86 deaths attributed to food poisoning every year, which amounts to approximately one death for every 331 million meals served, a 0.0000003% fatality rate. And given that not eating has a 100% fatality rate, I kind of like those odds. But some people will point to those 86 fatalities and say, see, this is why we need food safety and stainless steel bench tops. To which I reply, not so fast. You see, some of those cases of food poisoning, some of those 86 fatalities, are happening from meals that were prepared on stainless steel bench tops. It's not just the bench top that presents a risk, there's all the other aspects of hygiene and food handling as well. So it's not just a case of install stainless steel kitchen, save lives, there's a lot more to it. The real question is, 
how many of those 86 fatalities would have been saved if the kitchen had stainless steel benchtops. You'd have to take the fatalities from meals served in homes or while camping or while dumpster diving and analyze those to see how many of those fatalities would have been saved if the meal had instead been prepared on stainless steel. There's no way of knowing without looking one by one at every death certificate and understanding the specific circumstances in each case. But I'd be willing to bet that very few of those 86 food poisoning fatalities every year would have been saved by stainless steel bench tops. But you may argue that even if it's only a few lives saved, let's say a dozen for the sake of the argument, then it's still worth it, right? After all, there's that classic argument, if it just saves one life, right? Wrong. We hear that shallow, vacuous argument all the time, and it's just silly. It assumes that there's no cost to the saving of that one life, that it's essentially free. It assumes that it's always worth it, no matter what the circumstances or costs. Well, guess what? Your life isn't priceless to anyone except you. Just ask any insurance actuary and they'll be able to tell you exactly what your life is worth. And I'll bet it's a lot less than you think. But before you get on your high horse, stop and think about two things. Firstly, death is inevitable. Cheery, I know, good news, death is inevitable. We're all going to die. So if something kills us, it hasn't actually stopped us from being immortal. It's simply reduced the time that we were alive by a certain amount. And secondly, there's only so much value that you can create in a lifetime. Yes, yes, I know you can't put a price on family and blah, blah, blah. Yes, you can. We as a society do it all the time. Insurance companies do it all the time. Courts do it. We all do it. So given these facts, uncomfortable perhaps, but very much facts, how then do we determine how much we're willing to spend to save one life? Let's come back to these stainless steel kitchens. The best data I could find indicates that there's at least 40,000 food service businesses registered for GST in Australia. That's at least 40,000 commercial kitchens at between $15,000 to $350,000 a pop. Let's assume an average of only $100,000 each kitchen. We've spent $4 billion on those kitchens. Now, to be fair, a similarly sized non-commercial kitchen will still cost about half what a commercial kitchen costs. So in effect, we've spent about $2 billion more than we would have if those food service businesses were simply held to the same kitchen design standards as a residence is. So let's keep that $2 billion extra in mind. The insurance value of a life it varies greatly depending on many factors, including age, earning capacity, health, the list goes on. But let's take the payout for someone killed in a workplace accident as our benchmark. In New South Wales, it's $891,100. Take that $2 billion that we've spent extra on these commercial kitchens, divided by $891,100, and we would need to save 2,244 lives for it to make sense for us to have spent that money on those commercial kitchens in that way. Now, before you accuse me of going all fight club on you and risking lives just to save a little bit of money, understand that behind that money, behind that $2 billion extra, there's people. There's cafe and restaurant owners, or more specifically, aspiring owners, who can't get in because of the cost. Costs like commercial kitchens. Commercial kitchens that are there to save lives that they're not actually putting at risk. I'll give you just one example of someone that I know personally, a friend of mine, who's passionate about beef jerky. Hey, everybody's got their thing, right? He didn't have the money to get into it commercially, you know, commercial premises, commercial kitchen, industrial quantities. So he wanted to make it at home in small batches and work his way up. Makes sense. Just one problem. If he wanted to sell a meat product like big beef jerky in Victoria, he had to have a commercial kitchen. No exceptions. Yes, there are some exceptions in some states for baked goods on very small scales and things like that. But he wasn't passionate about cupcakes. He wanted to make beef jerky. But then there was a second problem. He was renting. So even if he did pull together the money to install a fifteen dollars or $25,000 commercial kitchen at home, he couldn't do it. The landlord would never allow it, and if they did, he'd always be at risk of being evicted and losing his investment in that kitchen. 
But being the clever and resourceful person that he is, he came up with a solution, a commercial grade beef jerky trailer. Now, before you laugh, have you ever bought food from a food van? Great, this is the same thing, only it's a trailer built to meet all the relevant standards for the purpose of making beef jerky. The problem is that the council had no idea what to do with it. They didn't understand it. And so he spent his money, he had it built, and last I touched base with him, he'd been waiting for over a year for the council to give him a piece of paper that gave him permission to sell the amazing beef jerky that he makes. Yes, I've tasted it, he gave some to me as a friend. That's a dream, busted. It's investment, wasted. It's regulation for the sake of it, holding people back and keeping the poor poor. He had to spend money he didn't have to build a kitchen he didn't need, to save lives he wasn't putting at risk, to satisfy bureaucrats who still aren't happy. And that is, on a micro scale, the story of how we ended up here with what we call modern Australia on a macro scale. Rules, regulations, licenses, taxes, standards. We are wrapped up tight in red and green tape. And rather than keeping the little guy safe, it's actually keeping the little guy little. These rules and regulations, the, the, the costs and delays, these are things the big end of town can afford. As a massive chain franchise, do they care if they have to put a stainless steel bench top in? No, they already have revenue. They can get a loan from the bank and pay it that way. It's the little guys, the startups, the mums and dads, the dreamers. They're the ones being hurt. And that's not only true for stainless steel bench tops, but for any and every area where the government has decided to save us from ourselves. This is actually a massive problem. The, the stainless steel bench top, bench top stuff is just one really small example of it. But because it's such a massive problem, that means it's also a massive opportunity. As we hurtle at breakneck speed into tough economic times, and we are, where we're not able to save ourselves with more money printing because, well, that's what got us into this mess, one of the only remaining ways out is by dramatically cutting red and green tape, removing vast amounts of regulation and freeing up the economy so that those little people can do what they do best, innovate and create opportunities for themselves and for each other. So the next time someone tells you that we need more regulation, that we need the government to intervene to protect the little guy, remember the stainless steel bench tops and ask yourself, do we really need the government to look after us? Or is the real uncomfortable truth that we need the government to get out of the way so that we can start looking after ourselves? Let's get to the news. Regular viewers of the Aussie Y will know that I am very dedicated to the issue of human rights. I am, in fact, still up on criminal charges for supposedly uh, violating the law in support of human rights during the COVID era in Victoria. But one of the tricky things about human rights is exactly who does it apply to? Who's a human? Who has these rights? And nowhere is this question more contested than on the issue of abortion. There are some people who will argue that abortion is a woman's right, whereas other people will say that abortion is actually a child's right to live. And both of these sides are claiming human rights as the foundation of their view. Today here on the Aussie Wire, I have Dr. Joanna Howe. She is a mother of five, a Rhodes Scholar. I'm not even sure what that means. In fact, I'm going to ask her, what does that even mean to be a Rhodes Scholar? I hear the term and she is a professor at law and we're going to talk about what is her position on this very contentious issue of human rights as it relates to abortion. Dr. Joanna Howe, thank you so much for joining us here at the Aussie Wire. Thank you, Topher. Uh, wonderful to be on the show. Joanna, I, I do have to lead with this question. I hear this term Rhodes Scholar. I know I could Google it. I could <laughs> I could pretend like I knew all along and, and like be the clever one, but I'm not going to be dishonest. I actually don't know precisely what that means. Can you explain what a Rhodes Scholar is? <laughs> Look, I think it's, 
um, I, I don't even know how to answer that question, Topher, and I am a Rhodes Scholar. I think it's just one of those scholarships that gets thrown around as being a very prestigious thing to get, you know, like Bill Clinton had a Rhodes Scholarship, Tony Abbott, Malcolm Turnbull, Bob mm. Hawke. It's sort mm. of a, you know, it's one of those things that we hear. And mm. um, essentially what it did for me was when I finished uh, Sydney Law School, I applied for that scholarship. You have to do it before the age of 24. And it allows you like a, a free ticket to Oxford to do the degree of your choice. So I felt yeah. incredibly blessed to have that opportunity. And I did my PhD over there in law, um, had my first child over there at the same time. And that's for me what the Rhodes Scholarship was. It was this incredible opportunity that I would never been able to afford without it. Well, I find you a particularly fascinating person because there is this narrative in popular culture that you either have to be a career mum who, you know, you could be a lawyer, you could be a Rhodes Scholar, you could do all of those things, or you can be a mum and you can have five kids and you can raise kids, but you can't do both. But you've somehow managed to have five kids, be a professor at law, be a Rhodes Scholar and kind of combine all of that together. Before we get to this issue of abortion, which is where we're going with this interview, but before we get to that, what's your take on motherhood and this kind of modern approach to motherhood that you have to decide you either are this or you are that? Mm, so I see that as a very limiting belief. And I actually think the second wave of feminists really lied to women when they said um, you have to get rid of your reproductive capacity and potential if you want to succeed at work. That What they essentially said is you. it does actually link to abortion, Topher, because second wave feminism said women need abortion in order to be equal and free and empowered. And that's just not true because essentially what they're trying to do is make women like men in order to succeed right. in the workplace instead of demanding that workplaces change to accommodate women's reproductive capacity. So sure. I made a very intentional decision when I was at Oxford that I was a young woman who had met my husband young. I was very ambitious for my career, but I also wanted to have children and I wasn't prepared to sacrifice my children at the altar of my career success. Um, and it was a very deliberate decision. I didn't know how it would work out. But now on the other side of it, you know, I turned 40 this year, Topher, and I, mm. I feel so grateful that I had children at the age that I wanted to have them. And yeah. I built my career at the same time. It wasn't always easy, but I was fortunate to have good bosses and, and good workplace policies that largely enabled me to do that. And I think that's where we need to go rather than saying women need to end their life with their children in order to be free and empowered. I think we need to actually demand more of the contemporary workplace. That's a very good point. Now, you've you've made a, a name for yourself in opposing abortion, which many people would, would actually regard as being opposed to women's rights. Abortion is often characterized as a women's rights issue. Now, I'm a libertarian, politically speaking. Personally, I'm very conservative, but politically, I'm, I'm very much a libertarian. And the issue of abortion is one that splits the libertarian world pretty much right down the middle. Any surveys, it is really very close to 50-50 pro or against abortion. And what that comes down to is whether you really regard an unborn child, a fetus, or, or whatever you name you want to give it, as being a living human being or not. And that really tends to define this issue. How do you, as someone who has managed to be both successful in a career and a mother of five, what's your approach to abortion and why have you come down on the side that you have? So I should let you know that I was actually pro-choice in my early 20s. Right. And when I was at Sydney Uni, I was a card-carrying feminist and thought that women needed abortion to be free. I'd, I'd sort of bought into that position. I think a lot of young women are often pro-choice by default, but they haven't really thought about it. And I got challenged on my position on abortion. And the questions that I was asked was, you know, if it's not a human being inside a woman's uterus, what is it? Mm -hmm. If it's not a growing human being, if it's not alive, then how is it growing? Mm. Um, and and under what circumstances, if it is alive and growing and it is a human being, is it ever okay to kill a human being? Yeah, wow. And those questions really got me thinking about what it was I was saying when I said that I believed women needed abortion. Mm. And as I investigated what abortion was, and I, you know, I read academic peer-reviewed articles and actually in some of those articles they actually had pictures of aborted fetuses and as I read around it I realized that there was no justification for abortion mm. every time abortion ends the life of a human being and so it in my view if the, the other side has won in Australia because and then we have the most extreme abortion laws in the whole world and the mm. other side has won because they've shut down the debate and so I feel really called to start that national conversation, which is why 
I came out on social media last July. I knew I was throwing <laughs> my career under the bus that, <laughs> that you know, I, I, at that point I was an associate professor in Law Tofu and I put in my application for professor. But I, 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 I'd done that and then I decided and, then, and, I, and I, I, that's always what I wanted. That had been my dream actually to sure. be a professor um, of law. But then I just felt this stirring in my heart that I cannot, st- I cannot stay silent on this. Like mm. in Australia, we literally end the lives of babies right up until birth. Mm. And in fact, babies who are born alive after a failed abortion are left to die without any legal rights. And I thought, I'm a person that cares about justice and I just cannot be silent because where will this lead if I, if I don't speak up? So, Joe, this is a really confronting side of things that, that really transcends the, the question of abortion itself. And uh, we interviewed uh, George Christensen just the other the other week here on the Aussie Wire, uh, not because he's originated the Born Alive bill that's that's working its way through the process in Australia right now, but because he's been an advocate from, from way back in the day when he was an MP. Can you introduce us, as you just did in a way, and I just find this such a difficult concept to even wrap my head around, that, that in Australia, there are states where you you are required not to provide medical care to a child that is successfully born as a living human being if their mother had been attempting to abort them and failed. Yeah, yeah it's, it's absolutely mind-boggling, isn't it, that that is true. So mm. in Australia, we don't have a federal law protecting the rights of a child who's born alive following an abortion. And people ask, well, how can that even happen? Isn't abortion meant to end the life of the child? Mm. So how do they survive? And the reality is that when you get to a late-term abortion, often the method that's used is induction, induction of labour early. So the mother gives birth and they don't always poison the child or kill the child first through feticide. And if feticide isn't given, then over 50% of those children will be born alive, according to an academic study. That was a study of 241 infants. Over 50% were born alive. The average survival time was 32 minutes. And one baby even survived for 267 minutes. And we know that in Australia because of the statistics that are released in Queensland and Victoria that actually on average one baby every week is born alive and left to die without any legal rights under the law. And in Queensland, it specifically states that if a live birth occurs after an abortion, do not provide life-saving treatment. I, so that is just absolutely I, shocking that these babies are falling through the cracks, that they are not seen as persons under the law. And it's complete um, separation between our criminal law, which says you are a person from first breath, and yet these babies aren't conferred personhood. And, well, you know, we actually know some horrific stories as well, Topher. But please don't go into, into any more detail, t- detail than you already have. I mean, this is just such a difficult topic to even discuss. But correct me if I'm wrong, and, and you may not know either. Uh, I'm going to fact check myself on this. I'm doing this off the top of my head. But I believe that in the event of, for example, a car crash involving the death of a mother and an unborn child, that it's viewed as a multiple fatality. Uh, and and, and, and so yet... In, yeah. Sorry, please, please yeah, go. In New South Wales, yeah, so in New South Wales, they passed Zoe's law to, to make that clear, that if um, a drunk driver kills a mother who is pregnant, then that is, um, that is, a, that is a double count of, of, of murder. And, you know, in, in the um, United Nations where it talks about um, the death penalty, it says that you can have the death penalty, but you can't use the death penalty on a pregnant woman. Again, our international law is recognising that there's two lives at stake Mm. there. Mm. Um, In South Australia, the state that I'm from, from 20 weeks, if you suspect that a pregnant mother is abusing her child by smoking or drinking excessively, you can report um, that child to child protection so that an intervention can be made. In um, many states like Victoria and South Australia, a baby that is still born after 20 weeks gets a birth certificate and a death certificate but yet if they have been aborted, then they're called a product of conception and they're not entitled to that. So there are all these um, hypocrisies and mm. loopholes in our law that if we really thought about it, we would know the truth that what we're talking about here is ending the lives mm. of human beings. And, and, you know, where this is most extreme is after birth, but also from 20 weeks to full term 40 weeks where we are literally killing gestationally viable babies, babies that are viable from 22 weeks. And people say, oh, well, that never happens. It only happens because the mother's life is at risk or because the baby was going to die anyway. 
But in Victoria, we know that 44% mm. of late-term abortions are for a psychosocial reason. They're on perfectly healthy babies with physically yeah. healthy mums. Yeah. And I, I have actually friends and indeed a, a sister-in-law who was born in the mid-20-week range. And, and to think that, that these are, are babies that are just considered disposable. What, what we've done, I mean, I, I'm, I'm trying to grapple with this, but what it, it feels like is we're saying that the humanity and the life and the, the worth and the human rights of a child depends on how their mother feels. We're saying if the mother doesn't want you, then they can discard you. But if the mother does want you, then we'll bring all of our medical technology and all of our expertise to try and save your life in the event that you're born at that at that same age. How does a how does a society grapple with this? What's the way forward from here, in your view, Joanna? So, in my view, the tide is starting to turn. Like we've already seen in the US, Roe v. Wade being overturned. And that didn't change the law on abortion overnight, but what it did do is it sent it back to the people. And we now see that in half of the American states, we've got the people saying that they want restrictions on abortions. And in some cases, it's right up until heartbeat. So the moment that baby has a heartbeat, which is from three and a half weeks. Mm. And I believe that when people talk about this and they discover the facts, then they will change their opinion on abortion like I did. And they'll Mm. realise that this is not good for women and that it ends the life of a human being. And I think once we have that conversation, we will start to see change. So I think things like this are really good, Topa, because it brings the issue out into the open. Um, and I, I really do believe that in my lifetime we will see this reversed and we, we abortion will become unthinkable because we just realise that it, it's not in the best interest of women. Okay, I need to, I, I was going to, we're out of time. I was going to end the interview there, but I, I can't stop now. How is abortion not in the interests of women? Because this is the main selling point. This is what we're told. This is about women's rights to choose, women's rights to bodily autonomy. How are you as a woman, as a mother of five, saying it's not in the interest of women to have access to abortion? Okay, well, let's look at the reasons why women choose abortion. So the Good Market Institute, which is the research arm of Planned Parenthood, which is the main, like the biggest abortion corporation in the world. They've got mm. assets of $2 billion. So there's a lot of money. It's big in business. This. But even their research arm did a study of over a 1,000 US women, and they found what we found in study after study. Women choose abortion because of socioeconomic reasons. Right. It's because they're struggling financially. They don't have secure housing or secure work. They're in a DV situation. They've got an unsupported partner they Mm. don't have access to maternity leave or secure childcare. Mm -hmm. so women aren't choosing abortion freely the vast majority of women are coerced into abortion because of their socioeconomic circumstances so what we are doing is is forcing women we're funneling them down this path because we're saying this is actually quicker easier and cheaper for us to do but then we have all this other data including a meta-analysis of the mental health effects on women who go through abortions and we can see that it's detrimental it leads to increased mental illness suicide Mm -hmm. all sorts of consequences that ensue so it is such a lie that abortion is a is essential for women's freedom. And I think as we unpack all of that, we realise that as a society, we have to do so much more to get behind women and address the root causes. So if a woman's in a domestic violence situation and she gets pregnant, we need to give her exit strategies out of that domestic violence strategy. We don't just need to give her abortion. Yeah. Okay, so that's, that's, that's a simple example. But if a woman is about to lose her job or doesn't have access to childcare or doesn't have a house, mm. those aren't good reasons to kill the life of her, the human being growing within her. We need to deal with those root causes of insecurity and vulnerability. Mm. And so that's where pregnancy help centres, government funding, mental health support, these things are critical. In South Australia, 95% of abortions are for a mental health reason. And yes, in yet only three abortions. So that's not even 3%, but three abortions were listed as being for an existing psychiatric illness in the year that those abortions were made. So that shows you that these mental health issues are coming on when the, when the woman is pregnant. It's right. not something that was there, you know? And so we need right. to deal with that. We, don't, we shouldn't just be pushing women down this path. Um, and I think... The people that are pushing this, I believe that some of them are genuinely care about women, but I also believe that there's a lot of money behind the abortion industry yeah. and a lot of power and a lot of vested interests. 
Well, we've seen that with other medical issues as well in the, in the last couple of years. I think that um, the money making decisions uh, instead of doctors making decisions in the best in- interest of their patients is something that is uh, is going to very much be coming to the fore in the in coming years as we look back on the last few years. Look, Professor Joanne Howe, thank you so much for your time here on the Aussie Wire. This is a really confronting subject. I find it a difficult one to even talk about, but I'm, I'm very grateful that you're able to talk about it and that you've come here with us on the Aussie Wire today. Thank you. Lovely to be here. Thank you. Well, if you spend much time on social media, you will have noticed in the last few days an explosion of content around the idea of mRNA vaccines being used in livestock, particularly in cattle for lumpy skin disease. There's been a lot of information, a lot of noise and fury, and sadly, a lot of misinformation. And I wanted to get to the bottom of what's actually being proposed and what's actually being done on this very important issue of how we vaccinate our livestock and whether that's going to be suitable for being eaten and what's actually really going on. So I thought, Why not go to the source? Why not go to someone who actually lives and works with these animals every single day and has to stay up to date with what is going on and what the requirements are on him? So I have with me today Jake Walkie. He's a regenerative farmer. Jake, thank you so much for coming on the Aussie Wire. Absolute pleasure. Mate, regenerative farmer, uh, that's a term that uh, that most people won't have heard. I've heard of a sheep farmer. I've heard of a a cattle farmer. Do you grow regeneratives? What's what's a regenerative farmer? We graze regeneratives and yeah. <laughs> sell them on the stock market. <laughs> Help me out here. What, yeah, so, what is it that you do? Yeah, so Tofu, simply put, we believe that farms have the power and beyond that have the responsibility to regenerate our commons, common resources that we all share in our society. So things like air quality, water quality, soil quality and on top of that i like to talk on our farm so it was about also improving and contributing to the health and the wealth of our communities so we're very uh, focused on not externalizing any costs not uh, making anything subsidize the cost of production whether that be an actual government subsidy or the animal suffering or land degradation uh, we're really trying to regenerate everything without passing the buck to somebody else to pick up, you know, in 20 years or down the road or down the stream, whatever it might be. Well, this philosophically is quite a different approach to what I've seen with it with other farmers. I, I have a soft spot for farmers. I've spent a lot of time traveling around covering uh, issues related to farming and particularly around water. And a lot of farmers talk to me about kind of this constant battle they have against the degradation of their land. They're always bringing in fertilizer and having to balance this and balance that and bringing in all of these external resources to try and, and stop the degradation of their land. Are you suggesting that actually there is a way where that degradation doesn't happen in the first place? Absolutely. And it's just careful management. And the tool that you need to do that is livestock. There's no healthy ecosystems in the world that are flourishing in the absence of animals. We've been sold this lie that animals are bad for the environment. Animals are the environment. They're integral to the environment, but it matters a lot how we manage them. If you're going to throw all your pigs in a factory farm or all your chickens in a battery shed or all your cows in a feedlot, you're going to start to have to rely heavily on inputs Mm. and you're going to have some environmental outputs that are less than desirable. But if you can steward these animals in a way that mimics their natural expression, so think about uh, migratory herds of bison. We've all seen David Attenborough documentaries where they're they're grazing grass and the, the heavy impact, there's a lot in one spot and then it's a long recovery period as they journey across the continent. We're just trying to mimic those natural expressions on a micro level on our farm, using technology, things like electric fences and hot wires and portable water systems. Mm. So safe to say, to bring it back to the subject at hand and these mRNA vaccines and all this explosion of of noise and fury around that issue, safe to say you're not exactly someone who's in the corner of of sort of big industrial agricultural interests. Um, So you're someone that I do trust and I've reached out to you to, to, to kind of commentate on this a little bit and help me understand fact from fiction. There are claims going around right now uh, that mRNA vaccines have been mandated to have to go into cattle, that it's going to be in the food that we eat soon. There are claims going around that mRNA vaccines have been uh, introduced into animal herds and and had an extraordinary number of fatalities in those herds. I've been digging and trying to get back to primary sources on this, and I simply can't. I can't find any primary sources that are actually telling me that this is the reality of what's going on. From your perspective as someone who raises cattle and stays up to date with what the rules are, what do you understand to be the state of play at the moment? Well, to your first point, Tofa, I'm extremely 
conscientious about what we put into our animals. And that's one of the reasons I started farming in the first place. I'm not a generational farmer. I literally started farming so I could be sure about what was in my family's food supply. Yeah. Uh, with the, you know, the state of play with the mRNA vaccines in Australia, you sort of have to take a, a step back and look at the Australian economy uh, in, in agriculture with a bit more of a snapshot lens. You know, our industries with beef and sheep really heavily relies on our export markets. And Australia benefits greatly for getting a premium for our meat because we have this clean and green uh, image. And part of that is the fact that we don't have these diseases like lumpy skin disease or foot and mouth in our country. The, okay. the World Organization for Animal Health, which is part of the Food and Agriculture Organization, which stems out of United Nations, uh, has this decree that if you vaccinate for those diseases in your country, you lose your clean and green status. So basically at the moment, we can charge a premium for our beef exports to Japan, Korea, China, United States, because we don't have foot and mouth. Right. And if we vaccinate for foot and mouth using a traditional live virus or dead virus vaccine or an mRNA vaccine, from my understanding, we lose that uh, right. that premium that we can charge. We can no longer say we're disease free. So just to give you a bit of context, uh, right now, there exists vaccines for these diseases in Australia, apparently owns a lot of them, but they're not even in the nation. They're in a warehouse in the United Kingdom, to my knowledge, so that if we have an outbreak, we can fly them in rapid speed and administer them. But we can't even own these vaccines on the continent without losing our status. Wow. Okay. So this is an industry that is very, very mindful of trying to maintain this sort of clean and green image. So what is it, what do you understand to actually be happening with these these claims around these mRNA vaccines? You raise these very animals that, that we're being told have been mandated. What do you know to be true? I know that they're trying to develop them. Uh, I know that they're testing them around the world on different animals. Uh, you know, the reason that they want to shift towards these mRNA uh, vaccines at face value is purely because they're quicker to produce and cheaper to produce and they can pivot for different strains faster. You know, we, we, we've we we've all had front row seats to that over the last mm -hmm. three years. Uh, so, you know, I know that there's, it's no hidden secret that they want them to uh, be produced ready for execution. Mm. But, you know, I, I can't see a big grand play to preemptively roll these out in Australia. Mm. If there's an outbreak of foot and mouth disease or lumpy skin disease, these vaccines will steamroll into the country at breakneck speed. You know, they, they, they will just be on overnight flights and everyone will be scrambling for them. You can actually get on um, the Ausvet website Oz, and there's Ausvet plan documents that actually show you the master plan of lockdowns for animals. Uh, right. there, there's quarantine zones, there's abattoir lockdowns, there's, you know, meat stopping the, the trucks pulling over on the side of the road, all these measures to stop outbreaks and all that's documented online as to how that will happen. How that will roll out. Look, fascinating. This is an area of, of the world. I mean, I, I enjoy my food, obviously, uh, but how it gets raised and how it gets grown and how it gets to me in, in, in to my plate has been a, a, something of a mystery until about you know 13 years ago when I really began to pay attention. But having met you and, and having started to understand regenerative agriculture, I'm suddenly realizing that even though I know more than the average city bloke, uh, there is so much out there that I don't know. So, Jake, I look forward to speaking with you in future, getting updates as this story does develop. Always trying to do here at the Aussie Wire is truth, freedom and hope. So this is about truth. This is about myth busting and understanding what is happening and what isn't. But we are going to stay on top of this story and we'll keep all of our viewers up to date as things change. Jake Walkie, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you. Well, I'm sure you don't need me to tell you that cancel culture is a thing. It kind of came out of nowhere a few years ago and all of a sudden it was all the rage, almost a national sport or it's certainly a national sport on one side of politics. Cancelling people, not just the idea of, oh, I don't want to associate with you anymore. That's that's fine. That's natural human nature and that's a human right. But actually actively tearing somebody down, unpersoning them, trying to get them cancelled off social media and in some cases cancelled out of life. It became a big thing for a little while there, and a lot of people are, rightly if I'm honest, afraid of it happening to them. I can't speak out, I don't want to speak out, because they'll, they'll come for me, they might try and cancel me. But of course, that's the very fear that they trade on. 
They want us to feel that. So today I wanted to talk to somebody who was very much cancelled. They threw everything, including the kitchen sink, at my next guest. And she managed to weather that storm and come through the other side. And so my question for my guest today, Carly Soderstrom, is, Carly, is there life after cancelling you? They had a proper go at you. How are you doing today? It's not just life, Topher. There's a completely different universe. And it's almost like once you come through or, you know, once you see the light on the other side of it, you become a rejuvenated, completely unstoppable version of yourself. Hmm. You know, once you go through arguably one of the worst things you can go through, on the other side of that is nothing. There's no fear anymore. You, you feel like the shackles have um, have come off and you can just go and do whatever you want to do. So that's kind of been what I've been doing. Well, it's a little bit like, you know, beware the person who's got nothing left to lose. Once you've taken everything, you make them far more dangerous than they ever were when they had something to lose. I, I don't want to dwell on the past. And, and if anyone's not familiar with your story, they should go into the comments or go into the description of this video. There is a link there to a thing called Battleground Melbourne Live where you, uh, myself, Matt Lawson and Crystal Mitchell, actually told our stories at CPAC Australia uh, and people can learn more about the details of your story. I don't want to dwell on it, but just in very brief terms, there was a current affair, there was the newspaper. Talk us through, like, just so that people understand, this was a proper cancelling. Yeah, look, you know, with a bit of hindsight and a a lot of distance between the event itself, I'm able to sort of look back and dissect it, you know, uh, remove the emotion and be a bit more stoic about it. Mm. And what I recognised is the the original virality of my lockdown video, which people will probably be familiar with, the the velocity of which that went around the world was unprecedented, right? Mm. You know, a lot of people were having these murmurings of being really unhappy about lockdowns. A lot of people were really frustrated, but because they had isolated us, and, and worked so hard to, you know, instill all this fear, mm. there wasn't that sort of communication, maybe with your family, if you felt like, you know, you're on the right side of the argument with them. But what that video did is connect people, you know, mm. and, and not to sort of showboat myself or anything. It gave people the the ability to, to sort of recognise that, hang on a minute, other people feel like this too. It's not just me that sure. thinks this is crazy. It's not just me that's fed up. Sure. And so... With the enormity of that video going so viral, I mean, celebrities were sharing it. Like, it, it went around the world and back again, 40 million views. <laughs> and for, for a week, the Aussie media loved me because mm. I was deliberately intentional with the the subject matter. I made sure I didn't touch on the vaccines. I made sure I wasn't, like, politically hyperbolic. You know, I wasn't left-leaning, right-leaning. I was literally just talking from a common sense, rational point of view regarding small business. Mm. And so for a couple of days there, you know, like people were like, well, yes, we agree with her. And then sure enough, our friends on the left had to find a way to discredit me because I was actually uh, impacting the 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 fear campaign, mm. right? Mm. So this is, oh gosh, I can't even remember. All the lockdowns kind of blur into one. It, I want to say it was lockdown four or five. It was, it was somewhere in there. <laughs> And, and, and this was the first time I'd ever sort of noticed uh, any of your work as well. I mean, prior to that, you were a, a, a you, you were a fashion designer and you had a fashion label. That business ended, as many businesses do. You were then trying to rebuild your life. You you moved into photography, something that you clearly have a talent for. You've won many awards at that now. Um, and you were trying to rebuild your life. And then you just simply put a voice to what so many other people were feeling. And that was enough to make you a threat. What is it like now... You, you came through that and, and and without wanting to give away your own sort of private information, you reached out to me in, in some of those darker kind of times for you and, and it got pretty dark for you. Let's not let's not gloss over that. It got pretty dark. They the mob know how to be savage when they when they want to be. Yeah. You came through that. What was the what was the process for you mentally and emotionally to actually step out for the first time and begin this rebuilding? Well, I mean, to be honest, whilst it's happening, there's nothing you can do. I think, you know, I I said at the time when we spoke that it felt like I was standing in the middle of the MCG with 100,000 people just screaming at me and Mm. it wouldn't matter what I did or what I said, like no one was interested. Mm. They just wanted to have their fill of, um, you know, it it felt like a very public digital crucifixion, Mm. you know. It was a level of savagery that... I knew we were capable of, but I did not expect it to be so ferocious. And, um, you know, for a good month or so, I just went to the ground because there was was nothing you could do, right? right? And what I had to recognise was that, you know, I turned my phone off and it doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. That's the crazy thing, right? Mm -hmm. Like 
we get so invested in what's happening on the internet and we attribute this to real life. Mm. The second I could close my laptop screen right now and this this conversation doesn't exist. Correct. Same with my phone. I just had to log off Instagram. Mm. And so what I realized when I went outside, no one gave a shit. No one knew who I was. Mm. It, they knew who I was in the digital world. So as soon as you take the ammunition out of it, you know, it, you kind of diffuse the whole thing. It's not real. Mm. And within a couple of months and weeks, you know, the, yes, obviously that current affair stuff happened or whatever. They got their gotcha moment. Mm. And the the interesting thing is the argument, they, they couldn't dismantle it. They had to get a gotcha moment because I still had a point. I was mm. still making really strong arguments. Mm. You were still right. And thankfully, anyone with any uh, rational business sense knew that what they were trying to say, that, you know, I was this con woman, li- um, liquidation, all this sort of stuff, mm. they knew that that was a complete farce. It was mm. completely inaccurate because it's not possible. Um, so, so you just kind of had to wait out the storm and- on the flip side now, what it did is put me on the map and people go, well, hang on a minute, that's a photographer, that's someone in the creative industry who's on our side. Mm. That's someone who I'd like to do business with when I can mm. because I'm grateful she spoke up and I'm grateful to recognise that there's someone in that industry that aligns with my values. Sure. And that's what we're seeing now. You know, it's very much this parallel economy where those of us, you know, you and I are libertarians, but, you know, there are people in the conservative side and the, the right-leaning side who don't want to do business with these crazy woke left people. Yeah. It's it's beyond rationality now. These people are completely descended into nonsensical, you know, dystopian bullshit. Oh, sorry, I shouldn't swear. <laughs> but... Um, you know, now what people want to do is they want to do business with people who have the same moral values as them, and mm. that's what I'm seeing. Mm. Now, you're absolutely right. Now, I don't mean to brag, uh, but you've won uh, three photography awards that I'm aware of. You've probably won more. Uh, and one of them was uh, for a photograph of, of this face right here. So I don't mean to brag, but, you know, I have an award-winning face. Um, now, you mentioned you mentioned the arts a moment ago. The arts is an industry that tells itself that it loves to speak truth to power and that it's ever so tolerant and diverse. That was not my experience. I studied acting many years ago. That was certainly not my experience. I was basically told by my mentor. Uh, she said it nicely. She said I needed to run with the pack for a while. But what she meant by that phrase was get in line and stop being different. Uh, so, yeah. so what's your what's the reaction to you been from the industry uh, and the the more the artistic side, and and what's it like now? Fast forward a year or so, you, you're you're a multi award winning photographer photographing some of the biggest names in the world. What's that like for you professionally now? Well, it's, what's really interesting is you can correlate this to you know what's happening with Hollywood at the moment as well, right? It's mm. very much get in line you know, uh, adopt this narrative and we'll give you work. Mm. And we saw that with the Harvey Weinstein thing. We saw that with the Me Too thing. The original no jab, no job. Sorry, I I have to cut you off. Harvey Weinstein, the original no jab, no job. I've just, it's got to be said. (laughs) I shouldn't laugh, (laughs) but that is kind of funny. It's, I'm sorry. So, so, so I, sorry, I'm going on a sidebar here. I posted a, a meme that had a picture of him holding on to a young Hollywood starlet that I won't name, and, and I, I put the caption up, the original no jab, no job, and people lost their minds at me. What they didn't realize was that that wasn't my idea. That was actually brought to me by an abuse survivor who came to me saying, Topher, I'm losing my mind. I feel like I'm back in the abuse all over again. I feel like it's happening all over again, and no one will listen to me. Everyone is worshipping the abuser. In her case, she was referring to Daniel Andrews, the Premier of Victoria, the one who was locking us down again. That was the catalyst that led to me making that particular meme. But you're absolutely right. Uh, this Harvey Weinstein kind of you, you, it's just this total control. You will do for me what I want you to do or else you won't have a job. And we've seen it again in politics now. Yeah. And, and, and I mean, that's very much how the creative industry works, right? You mm-hmm. know, it's not about who's the most talented, who's bringing something new to the space. It's usually who is adopting whatever the set narrative is, whatever the politics of the day are. Mm-hmm. And then they they get chosen, right? You know, and they get um, propelled up onto a podium. Yeah. And then everyone oohs and ahs about their work. Is, is it innovative? Is it, you know, definitively something that, you know, is groundbreaking? No, typically not. Mm-hmm. It's something that, you know, toes the line. And what I've recognized now is that there is a lot of um, disenfranchisement in the creative industry. I mean, we're undervalued at the best of times. But what (laughs) you're seeing now is that 
there's this tokenism, right? And without going into woke politics, because we'll be here all day. Yes. What you see now, it's it, you're no longer rewarded. For, it's no longer meritocracy, right? You're, mm. you're no longer rewarded for being the best or, you know, the right person for the job. There's a diversity quota that you get awarded for. And it's particularly frustrating because it's like, I understand, you know, diversity and inclusion in a grand sense, yeah, sounds great, but you still have to do the job. You Correct. still have You've to have the actually talent. Be good. You know, awarding someone a Melbourne City Council, um, you know, grant to do something, but then being able to go on the internet and say that COVID's not killing men fast enough mm. is quite questionable. And I think we know who I'm referring to. <laughs> I'm you not going to name any names because I'm not in a hurry to get sued this week. <laughs> no, me either. And, you know, but it, that's what we're seeing, right? Yeah. And and so what I noticed through COVID and particularly with, my, with myself in my work is that I will likely never go for, uh, you know, a big industry award today because mm. I, I'm too um, controversial. Mm. But in 10 months, uh, ten, sorry, 10 years time, as that pendulum has inevitably swung back and the dust has settled, yeah. I will be because they'll be like, oh, well, you know, we've always loved Carly, <laughs> yeah. which is very Australian <laughs> because we love an underdog yeah. and then we love to tear them down, mm-hmm. you know, and we, we, we adopt things when they suit the narrative and then we discard them when they don't. Yeah. Um, but to answer your question regarding my career, what it's done has opened extraordinary doors that I like inconceivable prior to this whole COVID stuff. You know, being able to photograph Jordan Peters Jordan Peterson's portrait, like that wasn't even on my radar. And, and may let I say, alone- you're underselling yourself because he then picked that picture that you took of him and has used it across all of his social media. If you go onto any of Jordan Peterson's social media, that image he has in his thumbnail was photographed by this lady right here. It was. And Jordan reached out to me directly to thank me and say it's one of his favorite <laughs> ever in- images, which, you know, like that's that's pretty big. It's pretty cool. So, it's pretty cool. Um, yeah, and and weirdly, and I, I say this not to sh- uh, to you know to tro- toot my own horn here. I say this to hopefully inspire anyone else, like exactly. not just in the creative industry, but anyone else who's feeling like maybe a little bit more emboldened to use their voice. Mm. What it does when you speak up is show other people who might be industry leaders that there are people willing to risk things yeah. below them, yeah. and it emboldens them. And, you know, I'll, I'll never say names because I don't want to get anyone in trouble, but I can tell you now a couple of the A-listers I have worked with recently feel exactly the way we do about what's going on. Right. But given they have so many big contracts and things in place, yeah. like, you know, the mechanics of the industry, that it, it makes it harder. And mm-hmm. I know that's not what a lot of people want to hear, right? Mm-hmm. Like a lot of people, your, your general population don't want to hear that, this person can't speak up because there's money at play. It, yeah. It's not money. You're talking jobs. You're talking people's livelihoods. Mm. Losing big contracts isn't just affecting that person. It's affecting all the crew, all the, all the staff yeah. under it. So, yeah. you know, there are massive catastrophic complications mm. if you do things without pre-thinking. Mm. No, absolutely. It, look, it's, it, the, the arts industry is a fascinating industry. It's one that rates itself incredibly highly and is probably among the most hypocritical in the world. And yet, in spite of that, it does genuinely bring enormous value to our lives. Uh, Carly, I do have to call an end to, the, to, to this segment there. This has been an amazing chat. Uh, you're someone that I respect uh, immensely. What you've done, what you've been through, and how you've come out of that to get on with your life I just respect immensely. The quality of your work is amazing. You know and I know that we're going to be doing some very exciting work in coming months that we can't talk about publicly yet. So I'm just going to leave that there as a little little breadcrumb for those that are paying attention. But Carly Soderstrom, uh, thank you so much for coming on the Aussie Wire today. Thanks for having me, Toho. Thank you for watching The Aussie Wire. To catch up with past episodes, go to theaussiewire.com and while you're there, be sure to join our email list so we can keep in touch even if we get cancelled. Make sure you follow us on all the social media channels at theaussiewire.com and if you love what we're doing, please support us by becoming an insider at theaussiewire.locals.com forward slash support. The link is, of course, in the video description. We release new episodes of The Aussie Wire News every Tuesday and Thursday at 4pm. Thanks for watching. I'm Topher Field and this is the Aussie Wire.